All right. Welcome TestJS workshop in invitees and attendees. It's great to see everybody on here. Um, I uh, I wanted to welcome you to our, our little show that we've got. What we're going to do today is automate web app security testing using GitHub Actions. And this is a really fun, interactive workshop. Um, all you really need to attend is a web browser. It helps to have a Discord, the Discord app. We're going to be doing a lot of chatting in Discord. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But what we're going to do basically is we're going to we're going to fork a, a repo for a, a sample application, a Node.js application. And we're going to subject that to an automated build and test routine using GitHub Actions, which is GitHub's CI/CD uh, system that's built into GitHub. And it's free for use for, for uh, anybody um, for up to like 2,000 minutes a month, something like that. So we're gonna build that application and then we're gonna subject it to a bunch of testing, a, a variety of different security tests. And again, all you really need is a web browser because everything we're gonna be doing is through the GitHub uh, web interface. So that we can create files, fork a repo, create file, the, the files that we need, um, run the tests that we need using GitHub Actions and so forth. Um, what you need for this, um, Really, the, the, the primary thing that you need to, to join us is to join our Discord and um, to join the October 2022 Web App Security Testing channel in Discord. So I'm, I'm going to post that link here for everybody. So if you can go to the first link that I provide, the discord.gg xnmb blah, 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 click that link and you should join our uh, Discord server. And then from there in the general channel, just give a thumbs up to our welcome message. And that'll allow you to see the rest of the channels. Then once you're there, join that uh, October 2022 web app security testing channel. And then when you get into that uh, web app security testing channel, give us a thumbs up there too, so, so that we know that you're in there. Um, we, we already have a question. This is awesome. So it seems that I cannot check out the repos. Um, don't worry about that. You can just look at the repo through our website. Um, we're just following along in the README that's in that uh, in, in there. So I'll show you what that looks like. When you get to this workshop GitHub Actions, GitHub repo, all you really need from there is this README and you can click on links to get to stuff in there. The first thing we'll be doing uh, when, we, when we create the app is we're gonna fork another repo. All right, looks like we've got, we've got folks joining in on the Discord server. GitHub link in the discussion panel window. Um, I think you're. I think we mean this window. So let me give you this link. So here's the workbook uh, or the guidebook for the workshop that we'll be going through. If any of this stuff is not working, you should still be able to fo follow along. Again, really, all you need is a, a web browser and access access to GitHub. So a GitHub account. I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, Feel free to drop questions uh, and and help each other out in the Discord chat, and uh, and and Mimi, if you can help folks along who are running into trouble, that would be awesome. I'll just begin with the slide. Definitely. Thank you. All right. Um, so here we go. We love questions. Please uh, drop us a chat in the Discord. We love to help out. My name is Zachary Conger. I'm a solutions architect for Stackhawk. Um, I have some hobbies. I really like DevSecOps, and this whole workshop is about DevSecOps routines and practices. Uh, it's a really fun workshop. You can take everything that you learn from here. It should be really useful in your work life, as well as your own home personal projects for working on your own applications, securing them, building them automatically, that sort of thing. 
So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the company that I work for, Stackhawk. It is one of the tools that we'll be using at the end of this workshop. And what we do is we've got a, a security scanning tool. It's called a DAST utility. That's the class of security scanning tool that it is, which means that it's a dynamic application security tester, which means that it runs against your running application. It actually probes your running application for vulnerabilities by sending in malicious requests and looking at the responses. And that class of utility, DAST, has been one of the hard ones to automate in CI/CD, and we believe that we've cracked that uh, that difficulty. Uh, a couple things about us: we're closer to the code. We're, we are a developer-oriented tool, easy to automate in CI/CD. We've got great coverage for web applications as well as APIs. And we've got a really simple configuration that just requires a YAML config. And we'll talk more about that later in the workshop. Our agenda today is going to be to use GitHub Actions to automatically build a node application. Then we're going to add a bunch of tests to that build process that we're going to set up. Um, so the first one is going to be a tool called Dependabot. It's another GitHub tool that can be used to scan your dependencies and look for vulnerabilities in those dependencies. Then step three is going to be we're going to add CodeQL, which is another GitHub utility. And that's going to scan your code base and look for vulnerable patterns in, in the actual code uh, of the application and flag anything that looks like it might be dangerous. And then the final step is we're going to add Stackhawk. That's our DAST scanner. And it's a dynamic scanner. We'll use that to scan an instance of the running application in the pipeline. So this build pipeline at the end of it is going to build your application, test it with for dependencies, uh, for dependency vulnerabilities, test it for code vulnerabilities, and then finally test it for runtime vulnerabilities. All right, so the first step is going to be to set up our GitHub Actions. Um, so GitHub Actions, if you haven't heard about it, um, it is a CI CD system that is built into GitHub. Everybody has it available as long as you've got a, a GitHub account. It's free. So in your free GitHub account, you can use this for your own code bases. It uses a simple YAML configuration language, and it's got a huge marketplace place of what they call actions. And actions are like Jenkins plugins. If you've ever used Jenkins, they're basically little packages of functionality that make it really easy to put together a build pipeline that does really interesting things. You can use it to build Java applications or node applications. You can use it to run all kinds of various tests and so forth. It's event driven. Um, so you can really put together very complicated and sophisticated pipelines using it. You can hit it via API. It's got built-in secrets management, which is really important for security testing and for security in general, because there are some things that you want to be pulled into your CI CD pipeline sometimes, like maybe passwords or API keys, but you don't want to put that in your GitHub repository um, because that can be a security vulnerability in itself for other for other people. It might it might come into contact with people who you don't want to know what those secrets are. And finally, it is free. So you can use it for, you get 2,000 minutes of build time free per month, which is really quite generous. So to begin, let's just go ahead and do that. So if you, you should be logged into GitHub and we are gonna, um, what we're gonna do is we are gonna fork this application called Volnode Express in the Kaka repository and we will provide a link to that. Mimi is dropping a link into the Discord, and we should probably drop it into the Zoom chat as well, just to be sure. So when you get here, what we're going to do is just fork this application. So from this main page, from the Volnode Express code repository, you'll see, of course, all of the files in there. But this button up here that says fork, uh, just click on that and you're going to fork this application over to your own repository or your own organization. So my 
my organization is called eConger. You might have a couple or your own personal one. Um, just make sure you're pointing at your own repository and hit create fork. So again, from this repo, I hit the fork button and then I entered the name of the repository that, that I wanna copy over. We'll hit create fork. And in just a couple of seconds, you should have a fork in your own organization. So now I've copied it from Kaka to my own org, eConger. It's called Vulnode Express, and it tells me that this was forked from Kaka, Vulnode Express. And Mimi, let me know if there's any uh, questions, if you need me to back up or anything and, and go over something. Totally. I think we're all good so far. I'm answering a couple questions in the chat. And everyone, if you could give a thumbs up to each step in the Discord along the way when you've completed it, just so that we know you're good and so that we can custom the pace to know if we need to slow down or clarify anything for you along the way. Cool. All right, so from here, what we're gonna do is um, I'm gonna refer back to this guidebook. So we've already forked the Vulnode Express app. Now we're gonna go into the code section and we're gonna create this new file. Um, the file is called, it's in the .github directory slash workflows slash build and test.yaml. And we're gonna copy the contents of this file and just drop it in there. So I am actually just going to copy and paste from here. First thing I'm gonna do is create this file. To do that from the Volnode Express fork that I created, go to add file, create new file, and paste in the name of that file and it should fill it in for you. So .github, so remember the, the dot at the beginning of that, slash workflows, slash build and test. And this directory structure, by the way, um, is special to GitHub. GitHub puts, um, uh, puts a lot of different files that it, that it may look for in the process of GitHub operations. And this special directory, .github slash workflows, any file that, that GitHub finds in there, it's going to regard as a, a GitHub Actions workflow. And it'll try and run it. So when it sees this file that I'm about to copy the copy the contents of, you can just hit copy there and drop that in there. Um, so when it sees this file, it's going to try and determine if it is actually a workflow. And if it is, it's going to try and honor it and do what the workflow says it should do. And let me describe exactly what the workflow says it's going to do. So the workflow is called build and test. It's a GitHub Actions workflow. And this build and test workflow is going to be triggered anytime we have a push to the main branch or any pull request at all. So if we do pull requests uh, to main or any other branch, um, this whole workflow should kick off. What does this workflow do? It's got one job and you could have multiple jobs, but this one's just got a single job called build and test. And it runs on an Ubuntu 20.04 instance. This is a full VM. It's got about seven gigs of memory. It's got some additional disk. Um, and it, it has a ton of different tools. So generally, it's a very well-populated um, well server that's got a lot of different tools that you might find handy for building and testing code. Then we're going to go through a number of test, uh, steps. And these steps use actions. And actions, again, are like these plugins, these packets of functionality that GitHub provides. First one is called checkout v3. And so anything that starts with actions, if it's a, if it's a GitHub action, this is actually um, a GitHub created action. So it's one of their standard actions. And all it does is check out your code base and it figures out the right, right place to check out your code base. Um, I have a question. Uh, can I repeat how to find the path to that file you're showing right now? Um, this file. So if you're from the uh, readme, it's under step one and, and it's called .github slash workflows build and test. Um, 
And so you, you're just going to create that file from the GitHub UI. And I'll go back and step through it in, in, in a minute. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, anyway, so we check out the code and then we're going to install Node.js 14x so that we can build our Node.js application. And again, we're using a GitHub official action called setup node. And it just goes through all of the difficulty of getting the right version of node installed, which can be a hassle, getting the right version of NPM installed. Then we're gonna install dependencies and this is gonna go through NPM install, just like it says. And then we're gonna run unit tests if there are any. And spoiler, we don't actually have any unit tests, but if we did, that's what this step would do. So now if I scroll to the bottom and hit commit new file, we will have created that file under .github slash workflows. The build and test file is now there. And now you should be able to go over to actions and see that that workflow is running. This would be a good checkpoint if you can let us know um, if you are seeing your own workflow running should be called create, build, and test. This is, the, uh, this is the, the commit message that we made. And if I jump in here, you can see that the one job that it has called build and test is running. And you can click in there and see more details about what it's doing. So it set up the job, it checked out some code, spitting out a bunch of garbage. Um, it installed Node.js and NPM and it started running through that NPM install step. So it's installing dependencies. And that really is all that it's gonna do. And then it will run unit tests, but we don't have any, so that step should go pretty quickly. So I'm gonna step back and just walk through that process that I just did one more time. Um, so we've got the workshop guidebook and I'm just copying and pasting from it. So from your forked repo, this should be your organization name, whatever your name is in GitHub, Bull Note Express. I'm adding a file. That file name is .github slash workflows slash build and test .yaml. And then once you do that and start filling it in um, with the content from here, then you can hit commit new file to create it. And just, just by having committed that, you will have fulfilled um, one of the, uh, you will actually run that workflow because once you commit something uh, to, to the main branch, um, this workflow says that uh, GitHub Actions should run this workflow. So it'll read this file in, It'll see that it's got a job that it needs to do. It'll read through the steps and it will run them in GitHub Actions. So by now, if you've gone through all of that, you know it usually takes a couple of minutes, um, but you should have a complete job, should have completed successfully, and you'll have a green check mark. Again, to see your actions running, you go over to this, this Actions tab and you can see all of the, the workflows that you've set up for this repo and you can see um, individual runs. So as we run more jobs in here, you're gonna see this list fill in with more and more commits that kick off more and more builds. All right, how's everybody doing? It's alive, excellent. Cool. Is it alive? for everyone else. Give us a thumbs up. Awesome. Does it appear twice? That's interesting. So if you, um, if you did two commits, I think you might've done two commits, which is okay. Every time you do a commit to the main branch, um, you'll see another action run. Doesn't, doesn't matter how small the change is. You can, do even, you can even do empty commits uh, and those will cause, cause the workflow to run. This is great. It's great to see everybody uh, playing along here. It's always awesome when there's participation. 
All right, so that's GitHub Actions. So we've got a simple workflow. Now we're gonna add some security testing to all of this. So now I wanna step back for just a moment and talk about these types of security testing that we're gonna do and the characteristic of each one of them and what problems they're des designed to solve and what, what the pros and cons of each approach are. And basically what I'm gonna conclude is that it's really good to have all of these tools in play if you can, but some are better than others at uh, giving you really actionable and, and information that you can really use to prioritize where you wanna focus your efforts, especially in a team setting. So the first type of security testing that we're gonna do um, is the easiest possible one and that's software composition analysis. And the way software composition analysis works, uh, also known in the industry as SCA, is that it really just looks at your dependencies. So there's a bunch of different tools out there that do this, and they can operate from your artifact repository, like NPM, uh, the NPM cloud service has a, a, a feature like this built into it. Um, JFrog Artifactory has a feature built into it. There's also tools that run uh, in, in your code base and can check out your dependency file and look very deeply into it um, and figure out if you're pulling in any dependencies that have known vulnerabilities, basically. So when these utilities run, um, they're generally really fast and they're really easy to act on. And in fact, a lot of these utilities will provide remediation for you. Um, the one that we're gonna use is called Dependabot. It's built into GitHub. And when it finds uh, vulnerabilities in your dependencies, it will generally open a PR to your code base and say, hey, I have a fix for this. All you have to do is accept this PR. And when it opens that PR, in our case, since we've set up GitHub Actions to rebuild the app, it's actually gonna go through the build and test phase and make sure that the change that it's, gonna, that it's um, trying to make is okay and doesn't break your code. <clears throat> so that's Dependabot, that's SCA. The next form of testing is called Static Application Security Testing or SAST, S-A-S-T. And this is a more sophisticated form of code analysis that actually looks at your static code. So it'll look at your entire code base. So it's language dependent. It needs to understand your code base. And um, the one that we're gonna be using today is called CodeQL. It's this little icon here. And CodeQL does understand Node.js as well as Java, um, uh, TypeScript. It understands C Sharp. It understands a lot of languages. And what it'll do is it'll try and compile it and sort of index it in a searchable form. Then it's gonna analyze that code base for patterns that look like they could be vulnerabilities. So for, for instance, it might look for user inputted variables. And if it sees a user inputted variable and you use that inputted val value to create a SQL query, then it's gonna make sure, it's gonna look and make sure that you've um, sanitized that variable before using it in the query so that, so that uh, the user can't inject malicious characters that could be used to do bad things to your SQL database. Um, the cool thing about tools like this, about SAS utilities in general, is that they can give you really specific information about where the problem is in your code. So they can point to the exact file and the exact lines of code where the problem is and it finds your bugs that you have written, not just bugs in your dependencies. The problem with it is that it has a lot of high false positive. It's kind of a hard thing to do to test for these things. And when it does find findings, even if they are accurate findings, what they're showing you are potential vulnerabilities. Um, they can't really prove that these potential vulnerabilities really exist in the runtime application. So, Pros, you can get to the file in line where the problem is, and that's a lot of really useful information to developers. Cons, they might not be real bugs. Um, so it's hard to prioritize fixes based on results that you get from SAST. Finally, dynamic application security testing, or DAST, is the kind of tool that Stackhawk provides. There's a bunch of examples of it out there in the wild. 
OWASP Zap is an open source uh, type of utility that's completely free for use. There's another one called Burp Suite that you may have heard of. It's sort of the big, um, it's the big old DAST utility that uh, most people in this space know about. And the way this utility works is, um, or these types of utilities works, they run on, they, they operate on a running code. So you actually have to stand up your application and then run the scanner against that application. And it will send in inputs and it will look for outputs. And what it's trying to do is prove that it can exploit, for instance, for instance, a SQL injection attack. Um, so it will try and do a SQL injection attack and gather evidence that that attack was successful. And then if it thinks that it's found vulnerabilities, it will tell you what vulnerabilities it found. And it will show you those input and output details so that you can recreate the problem and um, hopefully fix it and be able to verify that you've fixed it. Again, it finds your bugs. It tends to have very low false positives. And when it finds problems, it is generally, it is confirmed vulnerabilities. It has actually tried to exploit those vulnerabilities and shown that it could exploit those vulnerabilities. So those are the things that we're gonna test and we're gonna start with SCA. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and see if there's uh, any questions. We do have one question. It's the Discord link. So let me give you that. So I'm, I'm copying the Discord link to the Zoom chat. So join there, give us a thumbs up on the general page, and then um, please join our October 2022 Web App Security Testing channel. There you go. Okay, cool. Moving on, our next step is Dependabot. So this one's gonna be really easy to set up. Let's go back into, uh, oh, actually, let me t tell you just briefly about Dependabot. So Dependabot is a free service for all GitHub rep repositories. It is enabled by default on any public repository. So if you just create a public repo, it should be enabled by default. It's also easy to add to private repos, and that's what we're going to do now. Because we forked it, uh, it didn't enable it on it by default. It wants you to, to enable it explicitly. So we'll do that. And that's exactly the same pro process you'd use for a private repo. It's also free on private repos. You can use this on any of your code. Um, as we mentioned, uh, it finds libraries with vulnerabilities and it automatically issues PRs for any fixes that it thinks that, that it can do. And those PRs, of course, will run through any automation that you have. So um, those PRs will kick off the GitHub action workflow that we already set up. It does have some false positives in practice. You should definitely always follow its advice if you can and stay up to date. Um, but sometimes it, um, it's false positives just in the sense that you, you may not be, your code base may not use enough of the library to expose the vulnerability that is, that is known to be present in the vulnerabilities that it finds or the libraries that it knows are vulnerable. Okay, let's move on. So what we're gonna do is go over to the, let me see how I describe it in here because there's a couple different ways to get into this. We'll go to the settings section of the repo we're gonna find the code security and analysis section. And then we're gonna enable the dependency graph, dependency alerts, and dependabot security updates. So from your cloned repo or your forked repo, go over to the settings tab and then find the code security and analysis section. We're gonna turn on the dependency graph. So this is the feature that's gonna allow GitHub to look for and find your dependencies file. And in this case, it's the, uh, uh, the what is it called? Uh, the package.json file and the package lock.json file so that it can understand what dependencies we're trying to pull in. Then we're gonna turn on depend about alerts so it can let, let us know when it finds vulnerabilities. And then we're gonna turn on uh, depend about security updates. 
So this is what's going to allow GitHub to open PRs for any vulnerabilities that it finds. And if you want, you can also turn on version updates. So not only is it going to look for vulnerable uh, libraries, it's just going to look for, hey, is there a new version of any of these libraries that you've pulled in? I don't turn that on uh, myself, but you're welcome to. It'll find a lot more stuff in that case. Let's skip code scanning for now. We'll come back to we'll come back to that in a minute. So if you have done this, and again, the, the path to get here is go to settings and then code security and analysis, and then turn on the dependency graph, depend about alerts, and depend about security updates. And if you have done that, then you should already see some security updates because it's so fast. It was already able to determine that I've got a bunch of um, bunch of libraries that are problematic. So come over to your security tab where you should have a badge that says 18 or so. In my case, it's 18. And then we're going to go into uh, the Dependabot section over here, and we can see what those problems are. And there's really quite a few critical and high security issues. I'm going to stop for a moment and, and see where folks are at. Um, got a couple chats in the Zoom. Nope, looks like we're good. Awesome. Looks like a bunch of people are catching up here. This is great. OK, so a couple things to, to notice from this page. Um, first. We've got like alerts for issues that we're finding. So we've got prototype pollution in Minimist. So I've got a library called Minimist. It's an NPM package. There is a critical vulnerability in that. Over here, you see this pull request indication. So it's already opened a pull request for that issue. And I'll pop over there in a second and show you what that looks like. And we're not going to merge those pull requests right now, but later on, um, after the workshop, feel free to try merging in some of those pull requests. I walked through this uh, workshop just yesterday and found that all of those pull requests were pretty safe to, to apply. Um, but I'll show you what that looks like in just a sec. So you can, you can drop into these, and they'll give you even more detail, typically, and link out to other information for these these issues. And obviously, you should definitely address any critical issues in your own code and high issues as well. Moderate and lows, you know, uh, also good to keep up on, but not quite as important. So I'm going to click on one of these. So this is showing me what PR this opened up to try and fix this vulnerability. And you can see it, it actually created a pull request. And I've got a bunch of pull requests now. Um, and it's tried to um, it's tried to merge this into the code base, and then it ran any tests that were applicable. So we can show all checks, and this, this is our workflow that we set up in our first step, and it ran through it and found that there were no problems, nothing broke, all of the tests succeeded. So you could just merge this in. I won't, but if you do, it will kick off that workflow again and try and run all of those tests. Um, backing up into the whole pull requests section, you can see that there are a bunch of pull requests, and they all have this tag dependency, and they were all opened by Dependabot. And just to round out you know, what, what we're seeing here, if I go over to, to actions, you can see all of these new actions workflow runs. Each one of these has tried you know, uh, updating the code based on the PR changes, and then it ran through the workflow again, built out, built out our Node Express application, tried running all of the unit tests. And that's basically all there is to it. As you can see, it's really super easy to work with. So now I want to move on, um, unless we've got any blockers out there that uh, we need to address. I'm sure Mimi will let me know if there's anything critical I need to back up and repeat. Yeah, looks like no questions at the moment. So I think we can keep going. Nice. Okay. 
Next step, CodeQL. So again, this is the SAS utility. Um, it's a code analysis engine. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to compile our code. Really, in, in our case, since it's JavaScript, it doesn't even need to compile it. And it's going to try and run through the code and look for vulnerable patterns. And we'll see if it finds anything. Um, a couple things about CodeQL. It is free for use for public repositories, and our repository is public since we forked it from a public repo. Um, so we're, we're going to be able to turn this on for free and use it. If you want to use it on private repos, you do need to use the GitHub security license, and that uh, does cost extra. But if you've got any public repos, your own personal projects, you can use it as much as you like. It will use GitHub Actions. It's going to add a GitHub Actions workflow to go through its own testing. Um, so you do use minutes on GitHub Actions. But again, they bake in a lot of minutes uh, per month for free. So it's pretty cheap to operate on public repos. OK, so let's do it. So, so again, we're going to go to the, actually, this time we're going to go to the security section of our repo. We're going to click on a button called Setup Code Scanning. And then there should be a big green button that we can use to configure code QL alerts. And I think this, this path has changed just slightly, but we'll work through it together. <clears throat> it's going to create this new workflow uh, in the same directory as our old workflow called Code QL Analysis. And then it's going to run it when, as soon as we commit that to the repo. So from your Forked repo, Volnode Express, head over to the security section, and then go into the code scanning section and configure scanning tool. And when I do that, um, it used to be that the, the default was to, to just do code QL analysis, but they're trying to show that there's really a bunch of security tools that are available here. Um, from other companies, from the open source community, and so forth. We even have one in here um, <clears throat> that you can use. I think we're down here somewhere. Anyway, we're in there somewhere. But um, today, we're going to just use CodeQL, CodeQL analysis. Um, so hit configure here on the CodeQL analysis card. And that'll take you over to this no, new codeql.yaml workflow file. So this is another just standard GitHub Actions workflow. And what this is going to do is <clears throat> it's going to operate anytime we try and push to the main branch or open a pull request to the main branch. And here's another kind of cool feature of GitHub Actions. It's also going to run this job on a schedule. So once a week, it's going to run this whole code QL analysis. Those are the triggers. And then the job that it's got is just a single job called Analyze. And then it's going to use some more advanced features of GitHub Actions. So it's going to use a matrix strategy. And this comes in handy if you've got multiple code bases. But it only found one language in our code base, JavaScript. And so it's just going to run that. But if you found, but if we found like, some JavaScript and some Java and some Go, it would create this matrix and run all of the analyses for all of those in parallel in a sort of matrix run configuration, which is kind of a standard CI CD concept, um, but they do it in a really nice, simple way. So anyway, it's just going to run against our JavaScript code. It's going to check out the repository. It's going to initialize code QL. Um, again, through this matrix of languages. It's only going to find JavaScript. It's going to try and build that. It's got an auto build routine that tries to discover and understand how to build our app. In our case, it's going to be really easy. Then it is going to um, run the analysis. And finally, let us know, again, through the security tab if it's found any problems. So I'm going to hit commit. And once that file is committed, again, and don't worry, you don't need to do any changes. Once that's committed, we should be running uh, the action for it. So over in the Actions tab, you should see you've got two new jobs running. One of them is our Build and Test job, and the other is the Code QL job. 
for the CodeQL workflow. So we could click into the CodeQL workflow specifically and see how that's coming. So we've gotten to the part where we've initialized CodeQL, we ran auto build, and now we're running the analysis, at least in my case. And this can take a couple of minutes. It's a, a bit more complex and compute intensive than SCA checking. <clears throat> so just watch your action and let's see um, how long it takes to finish. And then at the end of it, it should have a couple of results for us and we can go check on those. Hopefully it won't take too long. Do, do, do. I should have some nice hold music now. <clears throat> so once we see results, we, they should show up in this code scanning section of the security tab. Still running that code QL workflow on my side. All right, in my case, it's done. In your case, it might still be working on it. Um, so I'm gonna show what I got and then I'll loop back around and see if anybody else got the same, same results. So again, go to the security tab, code scanning section. And in here, you should see one finding, database query built from user controlled sources. And what it tells us is that it found in uh, our service slash search.js file on line six, this line and this exact section of code that it doesn't like very much. Um, so what we've done here is we are creating a SQL query that we're gonna submit to our database backend. And as part of that query, we're dropping in some search text that the user inputted. And that search text is um, built from a user provided variable. And, and the code analysis has determined that all we did was accept that text from the user, put it in the variable, and then use it in this SQL search. We didn't do anything. It didn't find any other instance of that variable where we were checking for problematic characters like uh, percent quote, uh, which is an escape character that can be used to inject another SQL command into the, the query. And so it's possible for users to use that to inject other potentially malicious MySQL queries. And we'll see later on that this is a real bug that CodeQL turned up. This really is something that you should pay attention to. But the, but the other cool thing to notice is that it's telling you exactly what you need to do. If a database query, such as a SQL or NoSQL query, is built from a user provided data without sufficient, sufficient sanitization, a malicious user may be able to run malicious database queries. And that is totally true. And you can with this application. All right, I will stop for just a quick moment and see if there's any other questions or see if folks have caught up. Looks like we're doing good. Nice. Awesome. People are seeing the same thing I am. Super cool. All right. Let's go on then to the next step. And of course, pull me back if there's anything I, I need to go back up and show. So the final step is Stackhawk. Um, and again, Stackhawk is the company that Mimi and I work for. Um, we think it's a great tool. Obviously, we're biased, but it really is a unique tool in this space because DAST is kind of one of the old standard types of security tests. And it's often considered to be a gold standard style of testing. 
because it operates against your running code and it actually tries to exploit vulnerabilities and gathers evidence um, that it was able to exploit those vulnerabilities. So when you find vulnerabilities with a DAST utility, you know that they are worth prioritizing because they're for real. And if you run this, and if you run these applications in public, you're going to get people trying to attack and exploit those vulnerabilities. So it's a really useful tool for prioritizing what you're going to work on in a team setting in terms of security bugs. But it, it, in the past, you know, with the older utilities, it's kind of hard to work with. They tend to be these big applications that are time consuming to, um, to configure and operate. And they generally have been run manually. <clears throat> so they're the, the same kind of tool that pe penetration testers will use when they do a penetration testing engagement. And so they, they tend to run on the same sort of frequency. People will use them once a month or maybe once a quarter. And the problem with that is that it's very infrequent. And when they find vulnerabilities, then it's hard to go see, it's hard to go find where those vulnerabilities are. Stackhawk's approach is to create this portable scanner that's really easy to run and easy to run in automation. And that's what we're trying to get to is just like those other tests are tests that can run on every PR, we want DAST to be a test that you can run on PRs as well. <clears throat> because if you can catch a new vulnerability on PR, you know that a PR generally tends to be just a small amount of code change. So if you run a DAST scan and see, hey, I've got a new vulnerability on this 20, 30 lines of code that I just wrote, then you've got really, you're in the best position to find and eliminate that vulnerability and retest and see if you actually got rid of it. So to that end, Stackhawk, um, it's a portable scanner. It's based on the open source tool OWASP Zap, but we've added an online SaaS platform so that you can track all of your scan results, scan after scan. It really makes it more usable, especially in a team setting. It's got a simple YAML configuration as opposed to Zap's generally GUI-driven configuration. And it's really easy to integrate into CI/CD. We also have a bunch of other integrations and one of the big ones is the JIRA integration so that as you find vulnerabilities, if you can't fix them in real time, at least you can create tickets out of them so that you can prioritize them and have other people work on them later. We've also got a bunch of deep API and graph GraphQL testing capabilities that we've added to this, which we think is pretty unique. So you can do really interesting API fuzzing things and inject your own data or inject really realistic fake data into your API scans. And we've got a free developer account for one app. So uh, let's just jump into it. So what we're gonna do is we will go over to app.stackhawk.com and sign up for an account. And this is gonna be a free account, um, but all you have to do is go to app.stackhawk.com and Mimi is typing in that, that address so you can follow along. And you can set up a new account and you could use your GitHub credentials or your Google credentials, which I'll use today, or you can set up um, just a, a, a you can set it up with your email address. If you set it up with your email address, it's going to ask you to provide, like, create a new password, and then it's going to send you a verification email. So you need to go check your email and verify. I recommend Google or GitHub just for ease of use. <clears throat> All right. And I'm going to use my personal account. And when you set up your account in GitHub, the first thing that you're going to see, uh, hang on, let me check the chat. Cool. OK, so the first thing you'll see is this, um, if you've used Google or GitHub. So it just says, hey, here's what I know about you. Here's your organization name. I'm going to call it my workshop org to keep it distinct from I have a couple of accounts. Um, and then just hit continue here. Next step, choose your adventure. Um, let's go with the default, scan my application, because we're going to just scan the application that we've already been testing. Um, you can, you know, 
you can go with Google firing range. That just in, injects a bunch of sample data so that you can start looking at scan results without actually having to run a scan. Um, but we will pick our stack, scan my application, and hit continue. And then now you should see this. So this first step in this setup wizard um, is basically telling you how to install the Stackhawk CLI if you want to. We don't need to worry about this today. And we've got uh, documentation on how to do this. So you don't have to worry about this step, but you do need this API key. Because um, again, we're just going to run this in, in CI CD. We're going to add um, a step to our GitHub Actions workflow that will just run this for us. But we do need this API key. So grab a copy of that, stash it locally so that you can come back to it. Um, and what we want to do is we're going to set this API key up. Thank you, Stackhawk Helper. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, that chat bubble actually does go to people uh, behind the scenes who can help you out if you have any trouble. Um, okay, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna grab a copy of this API key, and then let's go back to your repository and go into settings, and we're gonna stash that API key as a secret. So under settings, way down at the bottom under secrets, you should find an actions section and we are going to add an actions secret. And I'll step through this one more time. So we'll create a new repository secret. Please call it hawk, uh, all uppercase, hawk API key, hawk underscore API key, and paste your value in there. And that's just because our canned configuration is going to refer to this secret to inject, um, to, to use this API key in the future. So I'll add that secret. And again, the path to get there was from your forked repo, go to settings, secrets, and actions, and then hit new repository secret. Give us a thumbs up if you've caught up. And now I will go back to the Stackhawk application and continue. We'll hit next. Let's give it a name. I'm just going to call it the same thing as my repo, Vuln Node Express. And I'm going to call it the development environment. And the point of this environment name is really you can scan a single app across multiple environments and we just bucket scan re results by environment. You may have different characteristics in different environments that would give you scan different scan results. Uh, and that's why we do that. This application is gonna be running on localhost, port 3000 in the build pipeline that we're gonna set up. So just enter HTTP localhost 3000. I'm gonna paste this in. That's the name of your host that you should be uh, entering in the host section here. Um, important thing to note, it's HTTP, not HTTPS. The scan will fail if you do HTTPS, because when we bring up the application, it's just going to be listening on clear text. I'll hit next, and then the application type. Um, you can actually just say skip for now or don't know. Um, the other options will sort of ask more questions. Like if it's an API, we can pull in various information to know more about that API. Or if it's GraphQL, we can, you know, we can ask you if you've got a schema file or if you can point to an introspection endpoint and so forth. We'll just skip it for now. We're gonna do a very basic scan. Hit next. And then in the final step, you should have this sample stackhawk.yaml configuration file. And really, it's just these basically three lines or four lines of code that are important for that configuration file. There's the main app section, 
And in it, we've got the application ID, which is the ID of this application in the Stackhawk system, the environment development, and then the host that we're going to scan. So that just tells the scanner everything it needs to know about the scan that it's about to run. We'll copy that, and we're going to paste that into a stackhawk.yaml configuration file in our project. And again, we're just going to go through the web browser uh, and GitHub and go set this file up. So go back to the code section. I'm going to add a file, create new file. File is called stackhawk.yaml. YML, not YAML, although I, I think actually both will work. And then just copy the contents of that file in. And yours should look pretty much like this. App, application ID, environment, and host. And then when I hit, we'll, we'll commit this file. And that'll kick off our workflow, but it's not scanning quite yet. We need to add something to our workflow file for this to work. I'm just going to finish this out just so we've made sure that the application exists in the system and we're ready to scan. So again, I just created a new file called stackhawk.yaml, pasted those contents in, and committed this file. And now to get that to run as an action and to get it to actually scan the application in the pipeline, we need to go into GitHub workflows and add a step to our build and test configuration file. Before we move on to that, Zach, it looks like we're still waiting for people to finish the, the setup of the Stackhawk account. So we'll give you guys a couple more seconds and please drop any questions or give a thumbs up. Oh, the thumbs ups are rolling in now. Nice. Yeah, I'm just going to race through that one more time uh, in case anybody missed a step. So that configuration wizard is going to look pretty much exactly like what I'm about to do now. Um, if I hit add an app, I just called it the Balm Node Express in the development environment against host HTTP local host 3000. Then I called it skip for now, don't know and copied and pasted that into a new configuration file, stackhawk.yaml in your code repo. I'm gonna remove this new application though. Actually, I don't know if I can. I'm gonna leave it. I don't wanna tempt fate. Don't wanna tempt the demo gods. Okay. While we're so, waiting for that, we got a question in the chat about Stackhawk accounts. It says the website says free trial is 14 days, and you had mentioned it's free for one app. Can you provide a little clarity on that, Zach? Yeah, absolutely. So when you set up your new account, it is set to a 14-day free trial of the enterprise feature set, which provides a whole bunch of additional functionality. So there's um, there's things like SSO login. So you can hook it up to if you use Okta or Auth0 for SSO, something like that, you can use that. It opens up API access. So you can grab information about um, scans and applications in the system via our API if you want to program against our platform. Um, I think the enterprise account also supports webhooks. So you can send scan data as webhooks <clears throat> to a webhook endpoint. Um, it's just a bunch of advanced features, but after your 14 day trial, you still have access to one app and you can continue to work with it indefinitely, run as many scans as you want. Okay, so in the dynamic app scanning with stock, Stackhawk section of the, um, of the workbook, we're gonna add these lines to our existing, the first um, actions workflow that we set up. So I'm just gonna copy these, these lines and add them to the end of the file that we created 
in our first step. So again, that's .github slash workflows slash build and test. Um, navigate to that file, hit this little pencil button to edit the file. And then add these new lines in at the end, just like that. And this is YAML. Uh, you're probably all familiar with how finicky YAML can be with formatting. So just make sure these steps line up exactly with the steps before it. So we're adding these two new steps. The first is to daemonize the Node API service. So um, this, this app that we built, we're going to actually fire it up in the pipeline and run it in the background. So we say npm run start to, to fire up the web app, and then this ampersand sign in order to put it in the background so we can move on to the next step. So it's up and running. And then the next step is to run Hawkscan using our, our own GitHub canned action. So you run stackhawk slash Hawkscan action. It's going to pull in that API key that we stash in the secret store. And then it's going to start running that scan and post results back to the platform. So we'll be able to go see them in the UI. Commit this change. And once you do that, you should be, uh, you should have a new action running. And you'll actually have two. So make sure you're um, looking at the build and test workflow. And you can watch this as it trundles along. And it's going to run through the install dependencies step. That's probably going to take a minute, minute and a half. Um, run unit tests, that'll take no time. Daemonize the service will take no time. Then it'll start running Hawkscan. And that's the most interesting bit that we want to focus in on. While that's running in the background, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let me just show you around the application a little bit. Um, so this first section is the apps page, and this shows you a list of all of the apps that you've set up in Stackhawk, uh, including any environments that you're running in. So you'd get a, one of these cards for each environment. And these cards just show you at a glance, hey, here are your latest scan results uh, at a very high level summary um, in the development environment. Uh, so how many highs, mediums, and low severity issues did we find? And, and also, what issues have been triaged, either assigned to somebody or marked as a, an acceptable risk or marked as a false positive if we think that the, the test is in error? Then under scans, um, as you run scans, you'll start to see this list fill out. And you'll just see scan by scan, um, all of the scans that are uh, in the system, recorded in the system. And we'll go take a look at that in a little bit. This section is about continuous, well, about all of our integrations. So we've got continuous integration uh, integrations, um, so basically, though, we, we run on any CI CD platform in the world. All you really need for it to work in CI CD is either a JDK, uh, because the scanner is a Java application, or a Docker runtime. So you can run it as a Docker container. We also have uh, deeper integrations with GitHub that we are working with. Um, we may get into today if we can get through this fast enough. Um, We've got a, <clears throat> an integration uh, really on many levels with GitHub. So part of what we provide with that is the ability to register Stackhawk as an official PR test. So it'll show up under the list of tests. Um, we can also post PR comments back to a, an open PR to show a summary of the scan results. And finally, we've got a GitHub Actions integration. So we can, um, and we're actually using that currently. That's how we set up the scanner step. We also integrate with Sneak Code. That's another really great SaaS utility um, that provides really, really deep analysis of your code. Uh, we've got a great integration with that. And hopefully, we'll, we'll show you a little bit of what that looks like with our GitHub CodeQL integration. 
You can send scan results to Slack or Microsoft Teams or to Datadog if you want to track your scan data there and Jira Cloud so you, you can create uh, tickets from issues that you find. All right, hopefully I've killed enough time for this to finish. Yes, good. So if you, if you are seeing um, that your action is complete too, zoom in on the run hawk scan step. And it'll create a lot of output, but sort of the key um, information that it provides is, at first it will uh, give you a little summary of the scan that it's gonna run. And this is sort of a, a pre-flight check that it's doing. So it's just making sure that um, it's got a, a valid configuration file. Um, it'll go through a bunch of other validation steps, like if you've pulled in, uh, if, you've, if you've set up authentication, so you authenticate to the app that you're scanning, it'll try that and let you know if that worked. If you set up some API discovery methods, like an open API config or Postman, um, postman collection that you fed into it, it'll try that and see if it worked. And it'll fail fast if, if any of those steps fails. Once all that is complete, it'll start the scan engine and it will start crawling and discovering the application, give you a little summary of what it found. And then it just starts hitting all of the endpoints that it found with every probe that it's got. Once uh, it has completed the scan, it'll give you a quick summary of results. Um, so at a high level, we found two highs, 10 mediums, and 13 lows. And then it'll list out the specific vulnerabilities that it found, in this case, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and a couple of others. But those are really just a summary for your benefit. And this is really useful, especially when you're running local scans, if you're running it from your IDE, for instance but the real results are going to be back out on the platform. And you can click this link to, to follow and find it. But um, if you can't find that link, you can just drop into the scan section and now you should see it listed. Click in there and see at you know in detail what you've got. Now I'm going to pause and make sure everybody else is seeing similar things, make sure we don't have any blockers out there. I'll check the chats. Cool. Looks like folks are following along. Nice. Nice. It's a good crew out there. You guys are keeping up. So this this should be like one of the hardest parts. If you can get through that, that section, getting the API key and secrets and getting the workflow updated and everything, this is really, this is really great. Okay, so now you should, should see your scan details. And this page is showing you, you know, a lot of the same things that, that the other tools have shown us so far. What are the findings that we found? Um, what is the criticality of those findings? These ones up top highs are definitely ones you should address. Um, and again, since this is a, set, a DAST utility and we you know, basically collected receipts on the problems we found, you know that you should prioritize these. So let's take a look at the SQL injection attack as an example. Actually, let's take a look at cross-site scripting because um, it's a little bit easier to, to sort of grok what is going on here. A first thing to notice um, is that when you click into the findings details, we give you a, a nice long description or, or a, a concise description, but we're, we're trying to educate users who come across this. So um, because not all developers are gonna understand all of these security issues, we just wanna try and explain what it is and how to, to address the problem. And so we pr provide this little summary. We've also got a bunch of cheat sheets that you can go to and these are basically showing um, examples of what this type of problem looks like in different languages and frameworks, um, and also what the fixes look like in those languages and frameworks. And we also show you what paths we found these on. So as we probed the application, this vulnerability was found on the slash search path in the app. We provide over on the right side, we've got request and response data. 
So this is the request that the scanner sent in, including this malicious text that we sent into the search text. And then the response we got back, um, in this case, if you, de if, you, um, if you decode this, here's the evidence. This is what we tried to inject into the search field, uh, a little script tag. And the response that we got back was that script tag. And so in old bad browsers that don't have security checks themselves, this would actually pop back a, 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 an alert, a JavaScript alert tag. So basically what we're doing is, what we're saying is we're, we're able to inject scripts into the web app, which is terrible. That is, that is a problem that is a high, high severity issue that you should address. And we've also cre created this curl command. So this validate button, if you click on it, will, will feed you back a curl command. And so if you were running locally, running this same app locally, and you can try this at home later on if you want to, um, you could actually recreate the attack and see the same response data that the scanner found. And this is a great way to sort of validate that you have fixed the problem once you, once you try and fix the problem. And the idea here is that we're trying to um, surface this information to developers. If you can do this in every PR and let a developer know anytime they've created a new vulnerability, um, it is amazing. They, they, they generally are going to be able to fix that right away. And if they can't, they can triage the issue in some way. So you might assign it. And if you had the JIRA integration lit up, it would create a JIRA ticket where you could mark it as false positive or risk accepted. Cool. Well, hopefully everybody has got a lot out of this. And I'd like to show one more thing since we're doing so good on time. And that is the code QL integration. Um, also, I want to open it up to questions. Like at this point, if anybody's got questions around how any of this stuff works, we can back up and talk about um, all of that stuff. Um, but for now, uh, I would like to try and set up the, the code QL integration so we can start to see SAST results. And let me tell you a little bit about this, this integration before I go there. So um, what we've done at Stackhawk, and this really is pretty unique to, to our utility, <clears throat> is we've created a couple of SAST integrations. And I mentioned that there's trade-offs with all of these different approaches to testing. With DAST, we've collected the receipts on every vulnerability that we find. So you know that it is a real vulnerability in your runtime application. And that means you should really prioritize fixing that. But the evidence that we show is a little bit limited. We can show you the request data that we sent in and the response data that we get, got back, and we can help you validate that. But it would be really handy if you could take a look at the code and understand where in the code base the problem is. And we can't really do that from this outside in approach to testing. Conversely, SAST has the exact opposite set of trade-offs. So SAS can look at your code and it can find vulnerable patterns and it can point you to exact lines and files um, where the problem might, might lie, but it's less accurate. It can't actually tell you if it's a real vulnerability that's really expressed in, in the runtime application. So the nature of this integration is to try and surface both, both bits of information at the same time. So you can prioritize it based on DAS results, but get that extra bit of evidence that really helps developers find the exact line of code that they need to look at to fix the problem. So we get that DAST accuracy plus detailed SAST evidence. So let's see if we can set that up. Um, head back into the Stackhawk application and go to this um, checker box section, our integrations section and go to the GitHub integration and click on that. And then just hit the enable GitHub button and point to your organization where you want to install the GitHub app. And then you could, you could light it up for all repos if you want to, or you could just narrow it down to the repo that we're working on today which is what I'm going to do. 
So I'll find, it's called Vuln Node Express. And I'll hook it up there. And so it's going to give us, it's going to give the Git or the uh, Stackhawk app access to the code and metadata and security events and give, give read and write access to commit statuses and pull requests. So if you went further with this, you can set up the integration that um, allows it to be an official test in PRs and also that allows it to post um, scan results back to the PR messages or to PR comments. We're not going to do that today. We're just going to do the code QL integration. So hit install. And I'll use my password. OK, and once you've installed it, uh, it takes a little bit for it to sync up, but then this is what you should see. You can manage the connection, and that will allow you to open up the aperture on what uh, other repos you want it to be installed to. So now that you've got that connection set up, you can add a connected repository. And so what we'll do is connect the GitHub repo Volnode Express to our Volnode Express repo on this side. And hopefully I've picked the right one because I created two that were the same name. All right, we'll see how this goes. But you should see a similar thing. So hook up your re repo to your app on, on the Stackhawk side and hit finish. And now to see this in action, we have to run another scan. So um, what you can do is just go to your latest build and test run and hit rerun all jobs from GitHub. So under actions, go to your build and test jobs hit rerun all jobs, kick that scan off. So we'll have to wait for a couple more minutes. While we're waiting, one person in the chat said their authenticator isn't working. Oh, for GitHub when it asked you to use authenticator? Mm. It seems like yes. Feel free to drop more clarification in the Discord if, if you have a more uh, specific issue. Yeah, what it's referring to in that case is um, it, it, you, you must have MFA set up or multi-factor authentication set up for GitHub. And uh, usually it will give you a couple of different options. You might be able to use your GitHub password again if you, if you walk through that flow one more time. Um, but the authenticator on, on my phone, I use the um, LastPass authenticator. Uh, a really popular one is Google Authenticator, but it's that one-time token thing and it's looking for, it wants you to go through, hopefully you've set that up on your phone or something and you select your GitHub account and it should give you a six digit code or something that you can pop in there. They have another integration. If you have the GitHub app on your phone, then um, another option for MFA is to go into your GitHub app and um, read in the code. They'll give you a little code that you can type in from the web interface as well. Uh, oh, somebody missed how I restart the build and test action. Let me, uh, let me back up and show that one more time. So from the actions tab, Go to the build and test workflow and select your latest workflow. Let's say it was this one, if, you, if it's all green check marks. Actually, I wonder if you can do it from here. No. Um, yeah, just click it on your latest workflow and just say rerun all jobs. Okay, let me see. Uh, if... 
So my build and test job is still running and now it's complete. So let me see if that worked for me. So go back to your <coughs> scan results, <coughs> excuse me. And if it worked, your latest scan results should have a new little GitHub icon under the SAST column. And when you click in, any findings that it found SAST correlations with should also have that GitHub icon. And then when you click in on those results, then there should be a new tab called GitHub Code QL. Click on that and it'll show you, hey, this vulnerability that I found on this side, the SQL injection attack, um, has a correlated bit of evidence from GitHub Code QL. And what they found was that in that you've got a vulnerability or, or a vulnerable code pattern in your search.js file. And you can click out to this to look at it directly. So now we've we've clicked out to the GitHub code repo and it's pointed out this line and, and that's where we need to look. A better view uh, is available if you hit view code QL details. So if you hit this button from the evidence pane, GitHub code QL tab, view code QL results, then you get this full data about, hey, look, in the search.js file, I found this line where you're trying to put together this query, yada, yada, yada. It gives you the full rundown of what, what the vulnerable code pattern is. So now, to put it all together, you've got a nice little summary of the SQL injection problem, the input output evidence that you can use to recreate the attack, and GitHub code QL evidence to show you exactly where in the code base to look for that problem and start fixing it. And just one more time, just to walk through this integration one last time. Um, in order to set up this integration, when you come into, first you go to the, the integrations section of the application. Um, sorry, let me pop this out so it's a little more clear. The integrations section of the application, go to GitHub, and then there will be an enable button here if you haven't set up the integration yet. Walk through that. Uh, on the GitHub side, it's gonna ask you what repos you wanna connect it to. Just select the Volnode Express repo. And then you'll need to add here, you know, a GitHub repo side and the Stackhawk side of the connection. And then, to see the correlated results, you will have to run another Stackhawk scan. So you can go back to your workflows, go to actions, uh, find your code or your build and test workflow, click into the latest one, and hit rerun jobs. And then that'll kick off the whole workflow again. It'll run Hawk scan again. And now as it, send it sends in results, it's going to be looking for those correlated results from SAST. I'm gonna go check Discord myself, see, see what other questions we've got. All right, it looks like folks have really followed along. Great job, everybody. It got um, you know, progressively harder as we went through the workshop. So um, really impressive that everybody is, has hung with us all the way through. And of course, if, there's, if, you, um, if you didn't manage to follow us all the way through, I encourage you to, after the workshop, go go back to the workshop uh, details here and just pick up where you might have left off here. Um, there's some other things in here that we didn't cover, um, but we also got you know, a couple links to other things that you can check out about Stackhawk, um, as well as Actions, Code QL, and Dependabot, uh, so you can do further reading. But hopefully this has been really helpful for people to sort of understand how easy and helpful it, it really can be to set up this sort of build automation in the first place and to add a bunch of security tests to it 
that can really help you write cleaner, more secure code um, just on an ongoing basis. It's really great to find these vulnerabilities as you're coding rather than having to wait until the end of the month or the end of a quarter or the end of the year when you get a penetration test and you get these results that are really disconnected from your workflow as, as a developer. Um, and these tools really help you bring them into the workflow, bring them into your everyday workflow. It just adds another one of those tests that gives you feedback right away if you've, if you've introduced any problems into your code. So next steps from here, at least on the Stackhawk side, um, we've got a bunch of content over at docs.stackhawk.com. You can read more about the scanner, um, more about more deeply configuring the application. Um, we've got docs on how to integrate into other CI CD platforms if you don't use GitHub Actions, if you use Jenkins or Circle CI. We've got great content over there about how to do that. And we've really got a nice blog too at www.stackhawk.com. Um, we've got a ton of great articles just in general about testing, um, sort of about walkthroughs, tips and tricks, um, just more details on how to write good secure code on an ongoing basis. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Um, really appreciate everybody hanging with us and I hope you guys got something valuable out of this workshop. Um, and, uh, and if I'm going to hang out for a little bit longer, if you've got any further questions, I'm happy to back up and go into detail. Um, if anybody wants to come on and chat, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand and we can, we can pull you into the chat if you'd like to ask questions verbally too. Yeah, thanks so much, Zach. That was great. If if you have time, it looks like there was one question in the chat we haven't gotten to yet. I added the repo, but Stackhawk is not identifying that GitHub is installed. I'm not sure if we ended up fixing that or if that's that's still the case. Hmm. Let's see. Add the repo. Not identifying the GitHub. Oh, so so do you still have like the little spinny circle where it says it's it's trying to connect? Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate the kind words. Restarted it and it's still spinning. Hmm. I wonder if, um, what about on the Git, GitHub side? Did you finish um, giving it permissions and allowing it to install the application? Hmm, that's troubling. I um, wonder if we can, Didier, uh, what is your username in Stackhawk? Let me see if I can cancel the integration and restart it for you. And to all the others, have a great evening, great morning, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining. Take care. I'm gonna, Didier, I'm gonna work on uh, seeing if I can find your uh, account and see if we can fix it. One sec. Didier, it's true. It could be your internet connection. If you've got a lot of packet loss, I could see that uh, causing problems. Okay. Interesting. Um, what happens if you if you log out of Stackhawk and then log back in? Um, does it still show you the spinny circle when you go to that integration page? Because on a, on the back end, it doesn't look like that integration has been set up. And I wonder if I can get you in on the chat so you can just talk with us.
okay, I have allowed you to talk if you're comfortable doing so. Um, yes. Hey. Oh, right. So I, I don't know if it might be my internet connection actually, but it's a, it's a spinning. The issue is that uh, when I did the integration, I uh, selected the Von repo, and uh, and then uh, I I, did, I don't know when when I got back to Stack Off, it didn't seem like it was installed. So I started it once again, and uh, it's just spinning for now. So, but I wonder if the issue might not be my internet connection. And. Uh, yeah, you can go. Um, you can also manage the app on the GitHub side. I wonder if. I wonder if that's potentially the problem. Um, so on the GitHub side, where where should I go to to see yeah, if it's canceled? Let me share my screen again. So on the GitHub side. <clears throat> go to um, go out to your org level. So in yours, it might be Didier. And go to settings. And there should be an apps section down towards the bottom, GitHub apps. And in there, you should find the Stackhawk app. And you can hit configure and make sure it's got permissions and check your repository action access. You might just for troubleshooting, because you can come back and change this later if you want to. You might select all repositories and save to give it a give it a kick. Okay, let, let me let me take a look at that real quick. Okay. Did Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I can end it. See the stack talk. Did it did it work? See. You can see the integration now. I can see the stack talk, but uh, the main problem is uh, is that it is still uh, uh, the enable the spinning. It's a spinning on uh, on the stack talk website, and if I go back, uh, it doesn't say that it, it's installed, and it allows me to enable GitHub again, but. Mm. When I try to enable GitHub and uh, it doesn't even tell me like to install it on on my uh, main organization, it tells me to configure. And if I uh, if I select configure, it uh, it's then uh, it's then uh, telling me it then it, it, it's not allowing me to select the von the von repo because it seems like it's already on it. Hmm. I wonder, I'm gonna, uh, do you feel comfortable sharing your screen? Yes, yes, of course. I, I just promoted you to panelist. Let's see if you can um, share your screen now. Okay, so it is installed. And you've got the right repo selected. Um, and okay, so there's the enable GitHub button. Try try hitting enable GitHub. Oh, um, oh, I see. Okay, so which which one of those orgs that you've got did you did you fork the repo over to? That one. So just click on DDA right there. Oh, I see. It's just not it's just not filling in from there. That's interesting. Okay, so then finally it gets there. And try 
Just for troubleshooting, try hitting all repositories and save. Come on, big money. Oh, I think I see what the problem is. Didier, did you have an existing account with Stackhawk already? Because it looks like it's, no, you're still in the free trial. Oh, it kicked you out. It's really weird. It's like you've got two accounts. Can you go back to that other window that you were showing? Because what I saw on that integrations page was that you had padlocks on all of the, um... yeah, on the other page, it's like you've got two different logins and one of them's got a, uh, those features or those integrations locked out. Hmm. Which could happen if you had an older account and it had reverted to a free trial. Let's see. How about this? Um, try deleting GitHub, uh, the, the GitHub app from the GitHub side. Oh, okay. So no. try uh, try to remove the integration, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I should go here and, uh, and remove it. Yep. Okay. And also, um, can you uninstall Stackhawk down in the danger zone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does not work. I don't know if it's if it's running. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like I say, I think uh, my internet connection might be giving some issues today. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can imagine that doing it. And uh, I don't know if it was still one in the task so install it on our repo as well. So, yeah. It's a warning, it seems. Hmm. What if you yeah. refresh this page or hit the applications? link on the left side yeah let me okay it's it's done it's uh, it's not here anymore oh okay okay cool yeah so now i could try to go to, to go back to stack Oak and try to do it from scratch yes yep all right so up i do in the work it up So, um, stay on this page. It should it should guide you. It's really interesting. Okay, so now it's a it should be a fresh installation. Mm -hmm. A repo or select the repo. Your preference. Uh, I don't know. Maybe our repo is gonna take more time. Yeah, just try. Try your forked repo. There you go. So, and then just wait here. It's gonna redirect you around a little bit. I'm pretty confident in my work this time. Maybe something was off in, in the first process. Yeah. Yeah, but the lock is, is here now. That's so a lock. interesting. And some of them, there's a lock on uh, Snake Code, uh, Microsoft Teams. 
Data Dog and uh, Jira Data Center, Jira Cloud, and Generic Webhook. There we go. Now it, oh, there it's we good. Go. Cool. Uh, cool. So, so I guess the lock was was normal after all. Yeah, I think it's just a transition screen that probably because your internet connection is a bit slow, it just it dwells yeah. a little bit longer than it does for me. Yeah, I guess that's why you never saw the lock. Yeah, yeah. So it should be, I guess it should be good now. And if I will want the jobs, I should have, uh, yeah. I should have everything. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not keeping you. I don't know, you want me to warn them now? Yeah, give it a shot. Let's see if it works. It should. Okay, so let me, let me go to the, uh, I think actions. Yep. And uh, this one. Yep. And then uh, we want all jobs. Aye. Okay. Then on some. I guess once they are done, I should have uh, uh, the relevant quad QL data and, and the scan section. Yeah. Looks like it's just taken a little while to spin itself up. <clears throat> yeah. I, 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 I had a question by the way. Do, do we need to, do we need to completely understand YML uh, a code. Do you need to understand the YAML? Yeah, do we need to understand it? Not really, although um, it's good to understand what YAML is about. Um, and there's some good guides out there on like understanding what YAML is. Um, if you use the scanner more, in order to use the scanner more in depth, um, you know, there's more that you would add to the YAML configuration file. And, and especially when you get into more complicated subjects, like how to, if you want to authenticate to the application that you're scanning, then it's gonna get a little bit more complicated. So it's good to understand that, but we've got good documentations. YAML is really just a file format. It's that, you know, style of indenting things and adding lists and key value pairs and stuff in a way that's fairly readable. It's it's really a superset of JSON. Are you familiar with JSON? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. It's just like a more readable version of JSON. Um, just for reference, I added to the Zoom chat a link to our docs, so well, it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah it's Pretty good reference there. And uh, thank you, of course, for helping me troubleshoot um, the issue. Of course. I'm glad we had a little extra time. That's uh, it's awesome to see everything that's going on under the hood. Nice. Yeah, I think I should uh, I should then uh, head over to my scans. This is my latest one. Boom. And uh, yes, if I go to my oh, it's um, it's great. Then I can see the code cure. Nice. That's uh, that's awesome. Sweet, congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, and uh, uh, I guess. Uh, See, see you in uh, another workshop. Yeah, we'll do it again soon. Thanks, Didier. Glad it worked out. Thanks. Thanks, everybody else. I think I'm going to go grab a bite to eat now. Hope you have a, a great rest of the conference and see some other good workshops. We'll catch you later. Thanks,